Right. So, um, if you were here last week, some of today might sound familiar. Um, we're going to kind of be going, kind of just continuing to, to pursue this avenue, um, continue to point out many different scriptures. So once again, I'm making some of this stuff up. It's there. It's rooted and grounded in scripture. Okay. But so we erased all the stuff we had on the board. So when we think of God, what are we supposed to see? Jesus. Thank you, Jessica. So God equals Jesus. Right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? So turn with me. Today we're mostly going to be out of 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, we'll have that up on the wall in a minute. Um, but go to John 1. Okay? So John 1, we'll start at verse 1. Okay, just to kind of, once again, we want to put some things in context here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Okay, so the Word of God, it does not say in the beginning was the Bible. In the beginning was the Word. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. Okay, so then when we go down to verse 14 of John 1, it says, And the Word became flesh. The Bible did not become flesh. Jesus Christ did. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a rank, has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He, Jesus, has explained Him. So, why did Jesus come to the earth? Because we as human beings had so misunderstood who God was. We had so adulterated the Word of God. We have so distorted the image of God that God had to come here and reveal to us who He really is. So we have a lot of things in the Old Testament that were human writings based upon their understanding of the God of, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus Christ comes and says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And here he says in verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. Why? Because they hadn't seen Jesus Christ yet. And last week we talked about John 5, 37. Well, I quote it when I can read it. This Bible is really handy, I'm telling you. This is a phenomenal book. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. And the Father He sent me, He has testified of me. You have ne neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His form. You do not have His word abiding in you, for you do not believe whom He sent. So he's telling people, religious people, Jews, who go to synagogue every week, who study their scriptures every day, and he's saying, you've never seen God at any time, nor have you heard his voice, nor do you have his word abiding in you, because you reject me, his very word. You search the scriptures, if you keep reading, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is the Scriptures that testify of me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. Then we go to John 14. Verse 7. If you had known me, 
you would have known my father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus, highly, highly met Noia, Debbie, said to him, I have been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak in my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. Then verse 12 is really fascinating, and I, I, I don't know if I, I might spend a whole year in verse 12 alone. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. So if you think that Jesus Christ came into the world, revealed to us who the Father is, made the Father known, Jesus Christ was then betrayed, arrested, beaten, scorned, scorned, spit on, mocked, nailed to a cross, died on that cross, was buried in a tomb, resurrected out of that tomb, and yet he says the works that you and I are going to do are greater than the works that he did. That is heresy. There is no way that can be true. But Jesus says, after I leave and go to the Father, the works that you do will be greater than the works that I did. Fascinating. Fascinating. And I really want to spend a whole lot of time just on that today, but... Oh, man, we don't got enough time. We have to start starting on time for me to have enough time to do that. So today we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 4. Mm. Okay, verse 3. It says... And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has binded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. Hey, Dad, can you give me some help there? My button's not working. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Okay? So, Dad, go back for a minute there. My, my, my remote does not work at all anymore. So he says, so he's talking about, so there's a little bit of context, We're talk, he's talking about in chapter 3, about how, remember when Moses went and got the Ten Commandments, and he came down and his face was so bright that they had to put a veil over his face, they had to veil the good news, and Jesus Christ says, look, that's because you couldn't see the Father, but now I'm here. You no longer, the gospel no longer has to be veiled, it no longer has to be covered up, and if... Our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing, those who will no longer exist, in whose case, the God of this world. Now, the God of this world, you notice that the God is not capitalized. He's not talking about God. He's talking about Satan. Once again, Satan, the principality of the air. Satan has authority and dominion and reign over the world. Satan is the God of this world. God created it, and he gave it to Satan. He said, here, I'll give you a world. I'll give you people. And I will overcome. And I will not only reclaim my people from you, but I'll reclaim my world from you. Which goes back into our part in the fact the work is going to be greater than the works that Jesus did. Because Jesus came to establish his kingdom. We're here to build the kingdom. We're here to remove Satan off of his territory. We're here to, re to establish the authority of Jesus Christ and to proclaim that this land will be under the authority of Jesus Christ. We will no longer bow down to Satan. We will no longer allow him to reign over us. We will no longer allow him to veil the good news that Jesus Christ has been here. And that Jesus Christ has been in us the entire time. 
First, first, or, I would say first Colossians. There's only one Colossians. Colossians 1.27, the mystery has now been revealed to the Gentiles. This Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Again, I'm not making this stuff up. But then he says, So that we, so that they, might not see the light, as they're being veiled by saying, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus Christ is the image of God. Okay? So, one more time, Dad, go forward for me. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. Okay? So God created the world, put Adam and Eve, put Satan in the garden. He didn't stop Satan from tempting Adam and Eve. He didn't stop Adam and Eve from falling into the temptation of Satan. Not saying that he caused it to happen. But he, he, he put Satan in the garden. He put the tree there. He allowed them to eat of it. He allowed Satan to tempt them. He, you know, we read the story of Job. We see what, what God allowed Satan to do to Job. Right? And there's some people who would say that Job is a metaphor for our entire planet. Um, I'm not saying that. Okay? But, but Jesus Christ came to show that there will be light that shines out of the darkness. This world is in darkness. And Jesus Christ came to have light shine out of the darkness. And the one who has shown the light in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Christ. So we see God's glory in the face of Christ. If we've seen Christ, we've seen God. He is the exact representation of God's nature. What does this have to do with anything? How does this change our faith at all? Well, we talked a little bit about last week. I'll give a few more examples today. The law says eye for an eye. You kill somebody, you get killed. And we've built millennia of human law based upon the Old Testament, eye for an eye. We've condoned death penalties. We've allowed it to happen. We support human politicians that support death penalties. But yet Scripture says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not yours. Vengeance isn't the state's. Vengeance isn't a judge. Vengeance isn't the government. God will deal with people how he deals with people. And Jesus says, the Bible says, eye for an eye. Well, what do I say? Turn the other cheek. Give your shirt and your coat. Go the extra mile. Jesus undoes the death penalty. Last week we talked about the Samaritan woman. The fact that there's a Samaritan. Once again, I talked about this several times. We talk about racism in our country. Racism between Jews and Samaritans was far worse than it was between whites and blacks in America. That was that was like hatred to the point where they didn't even acknowledge each other existed. And Jesus walked right up to a woman, a Samaritan woman at a well, and said, "Can I have something to drink?" And then he spoke to her, and she even said, "Who are you, being a Jew, who would talk to me, a Samaritan?" Why? Because Jesus is undoing some of our social constructs. Jesus is undoing the borders that we build to separate. Jesus came to bring people together, not to justify our separations. So then I mean, we want to begin to see things about God. And if this thing is true about God, then it's true about Jesus. Right? And so, uh, Ann and I had this wonderful conversation uh, uh, the other day, and we were talking about penal substitutionary atonement. Okay? And once again, this is not a straw man. I'm not building this theory up. This was in the doctrinal statement of this church. And this is in the doctrinal statement of just about any church you'll ever attend. Penal substitutionary atonement says that because you were born... Simply because you were born, God hates you and is so angry at you that when you die, He's going to send you to burn in hell for all of eternity. Simply because you were born. 
The moment you were born, God has rejected you because you contain original sin. And you are a sinner, and you're completely and totally depraved, and you do not belong to Him. You are not good enough for Him, and you are eternally separated from God. Simply because you were born. But the good news, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that says that Jesus went to the cross. And, and God poured all of his wrath out onto Jesus. God, God punished Jesus instead of punishing you. That God took all of his hatred for you, all of his anger towards you, and he put it onto Christ, and Christ is on the cross, carrying the weight of God's hatred and anger towards you. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now, God's wrath has been satisfied in Jesus. Wait. That's not actually true either. Because if you don't believe it, he still hates you. If you don't believe it, he still is very angry with you. But if you believe that Jesus, that God hated you so much that he tortured his son instead of you, he's not going to be angry with you anymore. And now you can become his child. Now you no longer have to live in separation from him. And then... And, Please understand, since 1549, this has been the accepted doctrinal position of the atonement across Christianity. I'm not making this up. It was in the very doctrinal statement of this church. The doctrinal statement of this church said that you are not a child of God unless you accept the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Right? So once again, I'm not building straw men up. This is what we actually believe. But the good news is, most of you have never actually realized it because we don't actually listen to sermons or pay attention. We just go to church every Sunday. It just becomes part of our routine. Right? So we don't realize that this is what's actually being taught to us. Because once again, they don't use the language that I use. They use language that makes it seem more, a little more palatable. But in a sense, that is what they're saying. And so what I would say to you is, is Jesus so angry at you simply because you were born that he's going to delight in torturing you in hell for all of eternity? Is Jesus waiting for you to screw up so he can send you to hell for all of eternity? Is Jesus waiting for you to mess up so he can punish you? If he's not, then God's not. If what we believe about Jesus is different than what we believe about God, what we believe about one of them is wrong. Because Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is the face of God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Jesus came to enlighten us about who the Father is. We didn't know the Father. We had never seen Him at any time. We did not know His form. We had never heard His voice. And we didn't have His Word abiding in our hearts. So obviously a lot of this has changed a lot of my perceptions. A lot of this has changed a lot of the things that I've been taught. And I want to clear up some of those misconceptions here. Because once again, I had to have another one conversation yesterday with, you know, it was fine, it was a good conversation, but people are saying things about me that just are not true. And it's getting back to people who now I have to have conversations that, you know, it's fine. I don't mind having the conversations. Um, but once again, they're all made out of misconceptions. Because what a lot of people are saying is that Jimmy doesn't believe in hell. Has anybody ever heard that? That I no longer believe in hell? Petrano. I know, I know you have. I know you have. I don't believe in hell anymore. That's not true. <laughs> I do believe in hell. I've been there. And I talked about that last week. Right? But what I don't believe in is I don't believe... That God hates me so much that after 70 years of living a sinful life and never coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, never saying magic words that he's going to punish me for millions and millions and billions of years in a lake of fire. Why well, don't want to believe that anymore? The Bible. If you want to turn with me 
Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters with in fire, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. So punishing people with fire, God says, it never entered my mind, and I never commanded it to be done. Well, that's just one verse out of context, Jimmy. I'm so glad you said that, whoever was thinking it. Jeremiah 19. Verse 5. And they built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, a thing which I had never commanded or spoke of, nor did it enter my mind. Okay? So, using fire to sacrifice people to appease an angry God. It never, God never spoke of it. He never commanded it. And it never entered his mind. Two verses out of context. So glad you brought that up. Whoever was thinking it. Jeremiah 32. Verse 35. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of ben Hinnom to cause their sons and daughters to pass through fire to Malak, which I had not commanded them nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination. So, using fire to punish people had never entered God's mind. He did not command it. And doing so is an abomination. But once again, we're not shown these passages. But they're there. So, do I believe that if I live my life as an unbeliever, and I get to the end of it, that God's going to send me to be tortured and punished with fire for the rest of eternity? No. Why? Because I don't believe Jesus would do that. If I've seen Jesus, I've seen the Father. If Jesus wouldn't do it, God wouldn't do it. Now, please understand what I'm not saying. Because once again, we just like to hear what I'm not saying and go on and say, Jimmy doesn't believe in hell anymore. I do believe in hell. I believe in hell more than I believe in heaven. Because I've been in hell. I've never been to heaven. I've seen hell. I continue to see hell every night I watch the news. Every night I meet the people who Ann knows in prison. Every day. I, I'm watching, I'm watching a, sh a show right now called Last Chance University. And these kids, these football players, and I'm just seeing the hell that they've come out of. I see hell all the time. It's real. But what I'm also not saying is I'm not saying that everybody goes to heaven. You never heard me say that. Everybody goes to heaven. That's not true. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that whoever believes in Him, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not, shall cease to exist, shall not cease to exist, but have eternal life. So, if I don't believe in Jesus Christ, I don't have eternal life. If I believe in Jesus Christ, I get eternal life. So, if I believe in Jesus Christ, I now have eternal life, and now I live forever. I now i am in the presence of eternity forever and ever and ever and ever. But if I don't have eternal life, how can I be tortured in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't add up. And once again, I'm not saying that you guys need to agree with me on this. I just want to clear up some things so people can stop saying things that aren't true. I'm not a universalist. I don't believe everybody goes to heaven. And yes, I believe in hell. 
So a couple years ago, I was still on the board of the DGF. And the Grace Gospel Fellowship out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Many of you will be familiar with that acronym. Um, we've been a part of them for a long time. Pastor Ed was a part of them for a long time. And I was a part of the board. And I wrote a letter of resignation. And I sent it in to the president of the board and the president of the GGF. And the reason for my resignation was I was no longer in doctrinal agreement with the GGF. So the president of the board, a wonderful man named John Lauder, he calls me and he says, What does this mean? What do you mean you're not? And I said, well, you know, I've been wrestling with things for a long time. And, you know, I'm really still really not sure on what I believe. But there are a lot of things I'm sure I don't believe in anymore. And he says, well, what are they? So I started with my view of hell. And I get done. And he says, well, that, that's an acceptable position of hell. That's called annihilationism. John Stott held it. Many of our people in the Grace Movement have held it. That's an acceptable view of hell. That doesn't disqualify you from service in the GGF. Now, mind you, the GGF is pretty fundamental. Right? So, if my view of hell is accepted by them, I'm on, I'm on pretty clear water. But then, he says, is that the only issue? And I said, no. I no longer hold the penal substitutionary atonement. He said, oh, that's a problem. Tell me what you mean. And I explained to him that I don't believe that God is an angry, drunk father who's coming home to look to beat me up for no reason. And at the last moment, my mother of Jesus Christ steps in and takes the beating for me. I can't accept that God, and I don't believe in that God. And I don't find that God in my scriptures. I don't find that God inside of Jesus Christ. He says, yeah, I think it's appropriate for you to resign from the GGF. Right? So, I'm not making these things up. These aren't straw men that I'm building to tear down. These are real things. And, 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 and yeah, I've moved away from a lot of the things I used to believe and a lot of the things I used to talk about. And yeah, there are things that I used to say that I no longer believe. But you know what happened? I found Jesus. I didn't find Jesus in the scriptures. I didn't find Jesus in a systematic theology book. I found Jesus inside of my pain. Rescuing me from the very hell in which I put myself in. The hell, luckily, the hell that I was in was temporary. But in the hell where I was in, I get out of the army. I'm, I go through my entire life, right? And I was always searching for identity. I was always trying to fit in. I was always trying to belong, right? I, I, I wasn't good enough. As, I was pretty good at sports, but I wasn't good enough at sports to be a jock. I really couldn't get into theater. I, I, wasn't, I couldn't be in the band. I wasn't good musically. I couldn't be in the band, right? I, I wasn't rebellious enough to be one of the stoner kids, but I, wasn't, I, I just didn't fit. I had no identity. And I was constantly trying to find something for myself. And then one day I joined the Army, and I put on a uniform. And I was told, you're a soldier. The first time in my life I had an identity. And then they said, you belong to this unit. And this unit was made up of men, um, because I was in combat arms, so there was no women, so I'm not excluding women, but I was in a unit that's strictly men. Because women aren't allowed to die in combat, only men are. I think they've undone that, but at the time. I'm in this unit with men. I have black men in my unit. I have Hispanic, Latino men in my unit. I have hillbillies in my unit. I have kids from Wyoming who grew up on a farm. I had a kid who grew up as a gangbanger in Compton. I had a Russian kid who immigrated here from Russia and lived in Brooklyn. Right? He so missed his girlfriend one day that he literally cut his hand and dripped blood on a letter that he was mailing to her. The weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. But you guess what? And then you had me from Lorraine, Ohio. And we all belonged to the same unit. And we all accepted each other, and we got along, and we fought together, we lived together, we ate together, we worked together. And the first time in my life, I belonged to something. I had an identity. And then one day, I got out of the army, and I was nobody. I wasn't a soldier anymore. I didn't belong to that unit anymore. And everything I had ever been told about God was that I didn't even belong to Him. Because I was a sinner. Because I was a drug addict. Because I lived the life that I lived. God couldn't accept me the way. So I didn't belong in church. I didn't belong in the army. I didn't belong anywhere. I had no belonging. I had no acceptance. 
And I believed in my mind that I was separated from God. And I hated myself. And I hated every single one of you. Because I believed in my heart that every single one of you hated me. Because how can you not hate me? Look at me. Walk a mile in my shoes and then not hate who I am. And tell me, tell me, anything that God could ever do to me would be worse than that. Please, I want you to tell me how that, anything can be worse than that. I was alone. God didn't do that to me. The God of this world did that to me. I allowed the God of this world to creep into my mind and tell me I'm not good enough. He told me I didn't belong. He told me I was nobody. He told me I was worthless. He told me I didn't deserve to be loved. I spent a couple years in hell. And then I met Jessica. And for whatever reason, I'll never understand. She loved me. I still to this day can't figure it out. And I know there's a lot of men sitting here today that know exactly what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I did to deserve it. And I didn't do anything to deserve it. I got it. Because God was showing me something. God was showing how he always felt about me. And so no, I'm not making these things up. And no, this isn't just Jimmy becoming some heretic. This is me trying to make sense of the God of which I experienced. The God who met me in my darkness. The God who continues to meet me in my darkness. The Jesus Christ who continues to show up when I don't think anybody else is going to be there. If I've seen Him, I've seen the Father. And my God would not do a lot of the things that pastors and churches say He would do. Because Jesus wouldn't do those things. What would God do for me? Think about this for a moment. What would God do? I would go to the cross. God would let me spit on him. God would let me betray him. God would let me mock him. He would let me beat him. He would let me nail him to a cross. He would let me kill him. Just to come back three days later and say, Is that all you got? Because I haven't given up on you yet. You're still my son. You're still my daughter. No matter how much you hate me, no matter how much you rejected me, no matter how much you go against my will, I have not given up on you. And I never will. And if that doesn't sound like good news to you, then we need to have other conversations. If the angry God punishing his son in your place sounds like good news, and sounds like better news than what I'm explaining to you, I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. I'm not going to tell you that I'm right. But this is the way I understand my gospel. This is the way that I understand my God. And I didn't find it in Scripture. I found it in my heart. I found Him there, holding me up, telling me I was good enough, telling me that I was loved, telling me that I deserved. I just couldn't hear Him because my darkness was so heavy it outweighed Him. And then one day, I asked, I said, Christ, are you in me? And he said, I am. Then I began to seek him. I didn't seek him in the scriptures. I didn't seek him in systematic theology. I went inside myself. Because you said you're in there. Where are you? Where are you? And I found him. Underneath my darkness. Holding me up by the very thing that the world was using to weigh me down. He kept me going. He kept me alive when I no longer wanted to be alive. He kept me going because He held me there. And then one day, I said, Jesus, will you come with me? He said, where are we going? I said, we're going, I'm taking you into my darkness. And I knocked on the door to my darkness. And I said, darkness, whether you like it or not, Jesus and I are coming in. And he came in and he shined a light in and through my darkness. And I no longer believed those things about myself. I no longer believed I was totally depraved. I no longer believed that I was some worthless sinner in the hands of an angry God. I believed that I was God's son who was fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. 
that God had a plan and purpose for me, that he predestined. Think about this. God predestined his plan and purpose for me from the foundation of the universe. He knew that one day he was going to need me to do a greater work than he did himself. So yeah, I struggle. Yeah, I have to have a lot of conversations with people who, for whatever reason, want to believe in an angry God. But I've seen the face of God. Because I've seen the face of Christ. And He was in me the whole time. He was in the whole time whispering in my ear, You're good enough. You're smart enough. You're handsome enough. You're whatever enough. And you belong to me. And you always have, and you always will. Father God, I love you so much. I'm so grateful that you rescued me out of the darkness. I'm so thankful that you put your son inside of me. I'm so grateful that you showed me your face. You showed me your love. And I no longer have to walk in blindness. I no longer have to veil your gospel. That I can see you. And I can see the way that you loved me. In the way that you poured yourself out for me. When I thought I didn't deserve it. When I thought I didn't belong. You said, I am yours. And Father God, I'm so incredibly thankful for the gospel that you have revealed to me in my heart. I am so thankful that you have allowed the scriptures to manifest himself in such a way that I find you there. I'm able to supplement my experience with this book. Father God, thank you for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. Thank you for every single person sitting here that they're able to see me the way you see me. And I can see them the way that you see them. Father God, I'm so grateful that you've never given up on us. And Father God, I pray that we will be able to repent and turn around and change the way we see so we can see the work that you have in store for us that is greater than the work that you did for us. Father, I say all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.